is set for presidential elections on Sunday. Keiko Fujimori de Fuerza Popular y Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. Audios comprometedores de la DEA que pueden complicar a Fuerza Popular. Keiko Fujimori le dio 15 millones de dólares para que los lavara. Peruvians have little faith in their politicians, institutions and even the law. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. Here are some of the stories we're covering this week. Peru has a presidential election coming, and the news media there are a big part of the story. Deserved. The incoming president of the Philippines shows no sympathy for journalists killed on the job. Peace and reconciliation in Colombia. Can media outlets there reflect the changing times? And tweeting from Moscow, how Edward Snowden sees the evolution of his own story. This week, Peruvians will head to the polls in a presidential election which has featured allegations of corruption and cover-ups, as well as some high-profile resignations, not of politicians, but of journalists supposedly covering the story. The two candidates in the runoff election are both from the political right, Keiko Fujimori and Pedro Pablo Kuczynski. Fujimori is the putative front-runner, or at least she was, until Peru's biggest channel, America TV, and the U.S.-based Spanish-language channel Univision both went on the air and implicated her in a money-laundering operation. America TV is part of El Comercio, which is by far Peru's biggest media conglomerate. The Fujimori camp says El Comercio's criticism of her has more to do with a historic vendetta than journalism. Then, last week, one of America TV's competitors, Pan Americana TV, aired an audio tape that it said amounted to a vindication of Fujimori. The trouble with that report was that the audio had been doctored, selectively edited to create a false impression, and the tape had been sent to Pan Americana TV by Keiko Fujimori's deputy. One of the Pan Americana journalists working on the story went public with it and then resigned. A few days later, the media scandal widened and the president of the channel stepped down, too. There's also a historical angle at play here, a generational one. Keiko Fujimori's father, the former president, Alberto Fujimori, is currently behind bars for human rights abuses during his time in power. He, too, had issues with the Peruvian media. His approach, he simply censored, bribed or bought out media outlets he didn't like. That was then, this is now. But how much has really changed in Peru? Our starting point this week is the capital, Lima. Usually, when a journalist is accused of having a bias, they will deny it, or at least try to hide it. In that respect, Peru offers something refreshingly different. As the country heads into the second round of its presidential elections between Keiko Fujimori and Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, papers like La Repubblica wear their biases on their sleeves proudly. We as a paper are very interested in undermining of Fujimori's control. Now, you could say that's not very liberal, that's taking sides, that's not being neutral. Well, I am sorry, but the media in Peru in these cases are not very good at being neutral. Definitely not. La Repubblica is one of the few media outlets in Peru not owned by El Comercio. The conglomerate owns America TV and another cable channel, Canal N. It publishes El Comercio, the daily paper, as well as titles such as Peru 21 and Gestión. In 2013, it bought out another paper, Correo, boosting its share of the newspaper market to more than 70%. The outgoing president, the left-leaning Ollanta Humala, said at the time the company's domination of Peruvian media was disgraceful and dangerous. No podemos hacer negocio. In this election, El Comercio rejects the commonly held view that it's backing Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, arguing it has criticized both candidates. But the company does say Kuczynski echoes El Comercio's principles and that its extensive coverage of the money laundering story has significantly increased its criticism of Keiko Fujimori. And El Comercio Group, through its different media outlets, are always against Keiko. The headline in bolded black is always an adversarial one. They are definitely abusing their position of privilege. Almost all of the media are on Mr. Pedro Pablo Kuczynski's side. 
That includes Channel 4, the country's biggest channel, El Comercio, the country's journal of record, La Repubblica, Peru's left of center newspaper. Who is with Mrs. Fujimori? I would say Channel 5 and a few discredited rags. Channel 5 is also known as Panamericana TV, and during this campaign, it too has become a story. Keiko Fujimori le dio 15 millones de dólares para que los lavara. When its rival, El Comercio's TV America, aired a report implicating Keiko Fujimori in a money laundering operation, Panamericana TV followed up with a recording that a source had provided on a USB stick in which the alleged whistleblower seemed to recant. But there was more to that recording than Panamericana put on the air and the channel failed to reveal who gave it the USB stick, a senior member of Fujimori's party, until one of its producers broke ranks and went public. When I listened to the audio closely, I noticed a large chunk had been edited out, the part that confirmed the America TV report. I also realized that the USB stick had actually been sent by the deputy of Fuerza Popular, Keiko Fujimori's political party. I confronted my producer, telling him we'd aired a doctored version of the interview. And I said, we are going to say who gave this to us, right? Because that's the source of everything. And he said, look, Myra, I have a family. I need to be on good terms with the top executives. And the source is not going to be made public. That's when I decided to resign. And the fact that Keiko's deputy is behind this could be a taste of things to come. Don't forget that Fujimori's deputy doesn't talk to the reporter, he talks to the director of Channel 5. He gives him an audio file and the director just sends it down the food chain to the producer, who gives it to the journalist, this woman who eventually just makes the whole thing explode. She went straight to the rival channel and oh what a surprise to which media group to El Comercio, any person with two brain cells, and it doesn't have to be a Fujimori supporter, will question immediately what the real intentions behind this were. Most of the hostility Peruvian media outlets have for the Fujimori campaign is not about ideology. It has to do with memory, Peru's recent history, and goes back to Keiko's father, Alberto, the country's president from 1990 to 2000. To call Fujimori Sr. a polarizing figure is to sell his legacy short. He is currently in prison serving a 25-year sentence for ordering death squads to kill his ideological enemies. He also shut down some media outlets he didn't like and bribed journalists to smear his political opponents. One can easily find videos online of his former security chief, the notorious Vladimiro Montesinos, buying off media outlets. This one shows him bribing executives at the aforementioned Panamericana TV in exchange for favorable coverage. Well, Alberto Fujimori's way of dealing with the media along the 90s was to buy the ones that were buyable and scare the ones that were scareable. That's what he did. I don't know what it is with television that for some periods it attracts shady characters. At that time, it was practically all channels. They were all in it. During Fujimori's father's government, freedom of expression was seriously damaged. What happened on Channel 5 is an indication of what's going to happen now. There's a history of this kind of media manipulation and subjugation, and we're not talking about low-level people. We're talking about the leadership. Keiko and all her supporters have acknowledged that media outlets were bought. It happened, and that it was done illegally. But there are other ways of being corrupt when you have a monopoly. They are deceiving people, reminding them of something that happened in the 1990s. 15 years have passed since the end of Fujimori's government. That's one and a half decades, long enough for the next political generation to step forward. Too long for some young voters to remember, but too soon, judging from the coverage, for the Peruvian media to forget. Other media stories that are on our radar this week. The Philippines was already one of the world's most dangerous countries to report on, and now the country's president-elect is saying that journalists deserve to be killed if they don't behave. 
Kasi hindi ka naman talaga papatayin dyan kung wala kang ginawa. Rodrigo Duterte will take office in a few weeks after his law and order campaign resulted in a landslide victory in last month's elections. Duterte also warned reporters that the freedom of speech provisions within the Philippines Constitution are not sacred and do not protect them if they defame somebody. The New York-based press freedom organization, the Committee to Protect Journalists, said Duterte's remarks give security officials the right to kill for acts that they consider defamation. According to the National Union of Journalists of the Philippines, at least 174 media workers have been killed there since democracy was established 30 years ago. In Cairo, three leaders at the Egyptian press syndicate have been arrested and charged with harboring fugitives and publishing false news. The syndicate's chairman, Yahya Kalash, its secretary general, Gamal Abdel Rahim, and Khaled El Balshi, the undersecretary, were all arrested May 30th and then bailed out by persons unknown one day later. This story goes back to a raid on the building a month ago in which two journalists, Amra Badr and Mahmoud al-Saka, of the progressive news site known as January 25th, were taken into custody and accused of inciting protests against President el-Sisi's decision to hand over two islands in the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia. They had sought shelter in the building. The authorities raided it anyway, which Amnesty International called the most brazen attack on the media the country has seen in decades. Iran has effectively put the Berlin-based messaging app Telegram on notice. It has one year to transfer its servers into Iran or the app will be out of business in the Islamic Republic. An estimated 20 million Iranians, roughly one quarter of the population, use Telegram not just for instant messaging, but also as a way to get uncensored news not available on other platforms. Facebook and Twitter are banned in Iran, but many users get around that through virtual private networks, VPNs, which are widely available pieces of software. The new rules for messaging apps like Telegram come from Iran's Supreme Council of Cyberspace, they were issued May 30th and also compelled Telegram to hand over data on its users in the country. Last November, the Iranian authorities arrested the administrators of more than 20 groups on Telegram for spreading what they called immoral content. Attempts to control Telegram are coming late in Iran, where even the supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, make use of the platform. Here's a quiz question that few people, even those who consider themselves news junkies, can answer correctly. Can you name the country that's still fighting the world's longest-running civil war, one that has claimed more than 220,000 lives, left another 45,000 people missing, and displaced 6.7 million? The answer is Colombia. The war there has lasted 60 years, but given a peace process that began in 2012, an end to that conflict is now in sight. The government of President Juan Manuel Santos and the leftist guerrilla group FARC, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, are set to sign an historic peace agreement. But as this story moves forward, are the mainstream news media in Colombia ready, willing to move with it? The country's former president, Alvaro Uribe, has launched a media campaign to discredit the FARC and the peace process itself, one that many news outlets have been willing to share. To counter that viewpoint, the FARC have started waging their own media campaign. They are the latest set of Latin American revolutionaries trying to recast themselves as legitimate political players. When President Santos puts the final deal to a vote in a national referendum, the Colombian electorate will need to know what's on the table. They'll be counting on their news media for balance and context. The Listening Post's Marcela Pizarro now on the role of journalism in the peace and reconciliation process in Colombia. Tune into the mainstream news coverage on the peace talks between the Colombian government and the FARC guerrillas, and you'll get this. Las contradicciones de las FARC que, al mismo tiempo que negocian un modelo de paz en Cuba con el gobierno colombiano, en Colombia intensifican su acción terrorista. Click on to Nueva Colombia, the new Colombia, a news channel set up on YouTube by the FARC themselves, and you'll get this. Se acerca el fin de la guerra. Importantes avances hacia el logro de un acuerdo de cese el fuego y hostilidades. Los únicos que transmitían eran los medios de comunicación grandes. The mainstream networks were covering this 24/7. They were the only ones with the funds and resources needed to keep journalists here waiting for the news to happen. 
we were the actual source of the news. We needed to do the reporting ourselves. The question was how? The internet was the only way to do this quickly. And that's how we've started doing what we're doing now, explaining to people what our political project is all about and doing this in a clear, engaging way. For a long time, we were invisible. We weren't really able to get the FARC's message out there to communicate our values and ideology. All we could do was to fight with our guns, to repel the continuous attacks. Communication suffered, though. We just didn't have the opportunity. Once we had all the comforts of a studio, you can imagine the difference between being out there in the jungle to being here in the city. Here we have all the equipment, the internet, social media, Facebook and Twitter accounts, the YouTube channel, the whole lot. The Fox press wing, former guerrillas turned broadcasters operating out of Havana, Cuba, may be telegenic, but they're only getting a few thousand clicks a week. ¿Qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Somos Nueva Colombia Noticias informando para la paz desde la capital cubana. But most Colombians get their news from the big TV and radio stations RCN, Caracol, NTN24, privately owned outlets that have millions of viewers. They've been telling the story of a conflict over land rights, which has pitted Marxist rebels claiming to fight on behalf of the country's peasants, but whose rebellion runs on drugs profits, against government and paramilitary forces. After six decades of this conflict, Colombians are sick and tired of the violence. While the government tries to de-escalate the language of war... In lugar de decirles estos bandidos, anti-narcotraficantes, eh, terroristas, pues referirse a las FARC. The media have insisted on ramping it up. The FARC have been seen, not just in Colombia, but all over the world, as a terrorist group. To dissociate them from drug trafficking, from kidnapping and extortion, from forced child recruitment and human rights abuses is very difficult. That background is what has made the negotiation so difficult, because for a sector of the population, the FARC will always, always be a criminal gang with no political agenda. The FARC are only considered from the perspective of their crimes. No one takes into account their ideals or the political positions they stand for. The narrative is steeped in legality and criminality. El gobierno y las FARC anunciaron hace pocos minutos un acuerdo que obligaría al grupo criminal a liberar de sus filas a los menores de 15 años. I think it's a narrative that has been strongly depoliticized. Of course, it's not a narrative that has been completely invented, as the FARC claims. They have perpetrated criminal acts which are not appropriate for a revolutionary or a political organization. One man who's done his best to undermine the FARC's legitimacy is Colombia's former president, Álvaro Uribe. During his time in office, Uribe waged an aggressive war against the FARC. Plan Colombia, it was called, a $9 billion campaign funded by the U.S. It was post 9-11, and the narrative was the war on terror. In 2010, Uribe handpicked his successor, Juan Manuel Santos, his defense minister. But when Santos staked his presidency on signing a peace deal with the rebels, Uribe became his most powerful opponent. Since then, he's been waging a one-man Twitter war against Santos and the peace talks. And with more than four million followers, and the ear of the mainstream media, his message has a significant impact. Alvaro Uribe is an emblematic figure in Colombia and a natural-born communicator. His positions regarding the peace process always generate interest in Colombia. He has been clearly against the process. He has put many obstacles in front of it and led the opposition against it. His strategy of sabotaging the peace process is a strategy steeped in lies. He does this on Twitter and this has an immediate impact on the media. This creates headlines, it becomes compulsory to talk to Uribe. And I think this has been the main factor in creating a public opinion that is against the peace process.
de opinión adverso al proceso de paz. Yo sí creo que la narrativa de la guerra que ha impuesto Uribe... The narrative of war imposed by Uribe has changed the way we do journalism here in a big way. If I interview FARC leaders, I can't do a simple interview like this. I have to be hard on them, as if they don't deserve to be seated there. This is the result of the war narrative. It forces Colombian journalists to be very hard on the FARC for fear of being stigmatized as guerrilla-friendly journalists. Estigmatizados como si fuéramos periodistas de la guerrilla. That stigma persists, and moving the story on, covering a peace deal with an adversary long considered the enemy, is proving a challenge. Cuando comenzamos, when the talks began, war was still being waged by the media, so we were a bit reluctant to engage with them because we were fed up with the harassment and slandering. We felt like the cameras were guns being pointed at us. We've been asking them to turn it down and to acknowledge their active role in the conflict. So at least now we've gone from terrorists to insurgents, which is progress, I suppose. At the start of the talks, it was very hard for me to have access to the FARC. They didn't want to give me an interview because they consider the media to go against everything they stand for. That's been changing, little by little. They've come to see that there are nuances, and that there are journalists reporting what's happening in Havana, who understand that the FARC need to have a media presence and to voice their opinion. This has been a mutual learning curve. It's a shame that the other media have not done the same. Lástima que no lo hayan hecho los demás medios. And probably won't for a while. And that's a problem for Colombians. Because it's not just politicians who can broker peace. In a society scarred by war, the media also have a role to produce responsible accounts of the past, to show what's at stake in the present, for society to make its decision for the future. Beyond the polarized points of view presented in the Colombian media, there is more nuanced journalism available, but you have to look for it online. La Silla Vacía, the empty chair, is a news and analysis site. The name refers to peace talks that failed back in 1999 when FARC's leader at the time refused to attend, leaving a key chair empty. The site was set up by journalist Juanita Leon, one of the first reporters, to expose links between Colombian politicians and paramilitary groups. Las Dos Orillas, which means the two shores, is an online news site set up in 2013 by Maria Elvira Bonilla, former head of news at RCN. This site tries to decentralize the story, since most of the national media in Colombia are Bogota-centric. Las Dos Orillas focuses on news from the two Colombian coastlines and provides a different narrative. In the piece, one of our interviewees referred to the absence of the victim's narrative in mainstream coverage of this conflict. One online site concentrating on that angle, as well as peace and reconciliation, is Verdad Abierta, which translates to open truth. And finally, the former U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder recently appeared on a podcast talking about his time running the Justice Department. They got onto the subject of Edward Snowden, the NSA contractor who leaked all those surveillance secrets under Holder's watch. Rather than condemn Snowden outright, as he had in the past, Eric Holder admitted that Snowden had in fact performed a public service by triggering a debate about the limits of surveillance. But, he added, Snowden must still pay a penalty for spilling the beans. That change in Holder's view reflects how the narrative around Snowden has shifted since 2013 when he first made headlines and was accused of treason, being a narcissist, working for Russian intelligence, among many other things. And that shifting story has not been lost on Snowden himself, who tweeted from Moscow, tracing how the debate around him has changed with the times. So we took Snowden's tweet, decorated it with a few relevant sound bites from Fox News, CBS and CNN to give you an idea of how Snowden sees the subtle shifts in rhetoric in his own story. We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post. What do you think of Edward Snowden? I think he's a traitor. I think he has uh, uh, committed crimes. The bottom line is, this is a man who has betrayed his country, who is sitting in Russia, an authoritarian country, uh, where he has taken refuge. Uh, it, you know, he should man up and come back to the United States. He stole very important information. 
that has unfortunately uh, fallen into a lot of the wrong hands. Governor so O'Malley? I don't think he should be brought home without facing the music. We can certainly argue about the way in which Snowden did what he did, but I think that he actually um, performed a public service by raising the debate that we engaged in and by the changes that, um, that we made.